is in the name of the Lord. Look at someone sitting next to you and say, our help is in the name of the Lord. For the Lord our God is mighty. Our help, our help, our help is in the name of the Lord. Well, good morning in the house today. Come on, stand to your feet. Let's worship God. Good morning, George. Good to see you. Come on. Put your hands together. We declare today, Lord, that you are God. You are our God. We love you. We worship you. In Jesus' name. Come on. See? 
say this battle is not mine. Come on, say it. No, say it. This battle is not mine. Lord, I give it to you. He fights for you. Come on, sing this.
into his gates with thanksgiving. That's how we get to him first. We just begin to thank him. Can you say that? Thank you, Jesus. Say it again. Thank you, Jesus. Grace that flows like a river washing over me. Fount of heaven love
Christ, you're my Savior, Lord. Sing it again. Sing it, church. Thank you. good to be back in the house of God today. Listen, it is time for you to meet and greet your brothers and sisters. Big hugs. Look, it's good to see you back in the house of God today. Come on, lights up just a little bit.
Welcome, welcome, welcome. Five minute hug notice. Four second hug notice. Two, one, this is why I don't work at NASA. Okay. Good morning, I wanna formally welcome all of you here this morning. I do appreciate the hugs and the handshakes, correct? One of my little groups that I belong to, it's a Christian group. You gotta be careful saying that nowadays, but it's a Christian group that I belong to. Last week they got all about numbers. Not theological, biblical numbers, but people numbers. You know what I'm talking about? And it was like it was this third grade competition. My daddy can beat up your daddy. My mama's stronger than your mom. Well, they got into this number game, and I, I don't usually participate in those things because I don't want to start a feud. So I usually, I have this brilliant capability given to me by God that my thumb can scroll past things. And I use that capability quite often. But they got into this numbers thing, I couldn't help but respond. And I shared my response on Facebook with you all that are my friends this morning. But let me tell you what I told them. And then you can pray that I don't, you know, get my home targeted by Google Maps. But I told them, church isn't about filling seats. It's about filling people, amen? And church isn't about reaching their wallets. It's about reaching their hearts. Amen? And church isn't about pumping people up. But instead, it's about lifting Jesus up. And when we do that, we're in the right paradigm. We're in the right philosophy. We're in the right theology. And I just thank you all for backing that today. I do want to welcome you. If you're a first-time guest, Inside your bulletin, there's a tear-out card. If you would fill out that card and turn it in at the front office, we would love to get right up, not office, the desk. We would love to give you a wonderful welcome gift um, for being here today. Also, if you've been here for a bit and you've changed any of your information, like your email address or your phone number, you could also put that on the information card and drop that off and we can get you updated. Now, let me tell you one of the benefits of being updated. That's one word, not hyphenated. Updated. I updated my information from my home phone, which we have had for, how long have we been married? 46 years? 46 years, we disconnected our home phone. I'm free, I'm free. So I had to update my phone number, and then I made sure my email and my address were updated. And do you know what I got in the mail this month? A free coffee card because it was October birthday month. Isn't that exciting? I don't know that we can backdate the birthdays, but fill out those cards and we'll get you one of those coffees. So anyway, let's get on with the announcements. First, we're gonna take up our offering and our tithes. As the ushers come down, I'd ask that you all prepare your tithes and offerings. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for these gifts we are about to receive. And Lord, as we said earlier, church isn't about wallets, Lord Jesus. It's about filling hearts. Filling seats isn't what it's all about, Lord Jesus. It's about finding you. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for every soul that you've brought into the kingdom. And Lord, we ask that you bless these tithes and offerings, Lord, that we can increase and we can encase, Lord Jesus, our community, Lord, in your works and your will. Lord, I ask that you bless everyone who has to give this morning, Lord Jesus. Those that haven't, Lord, I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that they find an abundance of blessing this week, Lord Jesus, and a testimony to next. Lord, we thank you, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name and the storehouse. Amen. Okay, are you ready? First announcement, trunk or treat, Thursday from five to seven. Do you know what trunk or treat means? Because I didn't know until I started like going to churches that had trunk or treats. It's where people go to a certain location that we will tell you, it's gonna be at the Life Center, 
but they go to this location, they decorate the trunks of their cars or trucks or whatever. You don't have to, but it's really fun to look at them. And then they give out free candy. This is a ministry. But when you're giving the free candy to the little people that are brought to the trunk or treat, the parents are bringing those little people to the trunk or treat. And it really is an extension of our church ministry and a way that we can reach lost souls in the community. So that's going to be from 5 to 7 at the Life Center. Please uh, sign your vehicle up at the front desk. There's an information desk. We'd like for you to sign up. And uh, we'd also like you to... Um, pass candy out if you have that ability to do so sign up to be a volunteer for that and you can stop by the uh, coffee shop I think to sign up for the candy pass out uh, positions also the color tour my note says color tour dead all in caps I think dead just got capitalized by accident but it's color tour deadline is today the age has been lowered to 60. So we have an age discount going on for this color tour. If you are 60 and over, you can sign up $20 per person. Per person. The destination, we are going to take country roads. We're in Southern Illinois. We pretty much got to take country road anywhere we go. You know what I'm saying? But we're going to take country roads to Lambert's Cafe. We're going to leave the church at 8 a.m. on Friday morning. If you haven't signed up, seats are limited. When we have lowered the age, please sign up for this color tour. When? We're leaving Friday morning. Yeah. If it's in my note, we're leaving Friday morning. Okay. <laughs> It's on my cell phone. It's on the internet. It's real. Okay. We're also going to show the love of God in a practical way. We're going to go to the Welcome Center, receive a bag to fill with personal hygiene items. They'll give you a bag today. Uh, we need items for men coming out of the reentry program that's here in Murfreesboro. The bags are due back on November 10th, so you have a couple of weeks to get these bags filled with items, toiletry items for men who are reentering our community. There's also, inside those bags that they're giving out, a list of the items that we'd like for you to be able to give, and I appreciate that. Also, if you are a veteran, know a veteran, if you don't know a veteran, hold a sign outside your home that says, if you're a veteran, please stop, because we'd love for you to invite them to our special veteran service we're going to have on Sunday, November 10th, right here in the service. We really want to honor our veterans, we also want to have some refreshments afterwards, so it's going to be a special day of veteran celebration on November 10th here at the church. Also, uh, I want to thank you all that are bringing candy for the trunk or treat. Um, you don't have to bring the Reese's. I need to do a disclaimer from last week. Um, the week before, I announced that Reese's has a new candy bar. They're called Reese's Thins. Mm -hmm. Those are not diet Reese's. I found out the hard way. So just to clear that up, bring Reese's, but there's no such thing as diet Reese's, okay? Everybody, look at the person next to you, smile, and say, we're ready for this. We are ready for this. Amen, and thank you. Good morning. I was raised Southern Baptist. God delivered me from that. <laughs> Hymns are part of my ancestry. When the contemporary music scene came on, I just embraced that with all my heart. And I just kind of shunned and put the hymns on the shelf. But there are some of those old favorites that you could just... There's an anointing there, there's healing, there's a message there. And I know that you know these songs I'm about to try to do. Um, just join in. Don't feel like you have to sit there and let me entertain you. Congregation participation required, all right? Thank you, Lord.
sing and shout the victory. The good news is you don't have to wait until you get over there to sing and shout the victory. You can do it right here. Amen. A uh, couple things. One is thank you all that gave blood uh, while we were gone. I think it was last Friday. You did, did a blood drive. They had four or 24 people they came in and gave blood, and I'm telling you that they were overwhelmed by that sort of response. They, they're just not used to it. And uh, so you saved, you helped to save someone's life, so let's give God a hand clap of praise for that. How many of you know that God is in the blood? <laughs> he, he's into the blood. That's why he sent his only begotten son, so we could experience that. Next week... Israel Bachu is going to be here playing the steel drum for us and speaking in the service. If you've never heard the steel drum, you want to make sure that you're here for that next week. That's the only instrument, to my understanding, that's been invented in the last hundred years. They took a 55-gallon drum and bent it and tuned it. I was in Trinidad several years ago. and. I was amazed at the music they could get out of things. We were on a work project building a church, and the next thing I saw were some young boys. One of them was sitting on a 55-gallon drum beating it. Another one had a concrete trial, trawl, using it and hitting it 
with a nail and another one had a break drum hitting it. And I'm telling you, we were worshiping God in the middle of that bush, wherever we were. But uh, it was, uh, you're in for a treat, come and be here next week. And then uh, next Sunday night, we have encounter night. So I want you to come expecting an encounter with God. Here's what I found out about God. As hungry as you are for God and His presence, He's hungrier for you. He, he, the Bible said that He inhabits the praise of His people. So make sure you're out here tomorrow night for that. Right now, I want you to welcome Troy and Teresa to the stage, if you would. Troy and Teresa, come on up. Give them a hand as they're coming. They're going to be sharing an opportunity with you uh, for this Christmas season, but you have to respond quickly. Tell them all about it. Okay, so I don't know how many of you have heard of the Operation Christmas Child from um, Samaritan's Purse, the Franklin Graham Samaritan Purse Organization. It was started approximately, well, over 25 years ago because our daughter is 25. <laughs> um, and basically, you take a shoe box, you can get just a regular cardboard shoe box or one of the plastic shoe boxes that you can get at um, Walmart, the dollar store, anything like that. You pack it for a boy or a girl, and there's three different age ranges, two to four, five to nine, and 10 to 14. And you can put school supplies, toys, all sorts of things in there. There is a do not pack list, but I won't go into that whole thing right now. Um, and, and they get sent all over the world to war-torn areas, places where there's been um, just devastation, whether it's natural disasters or things like that. They go to um, refugee camps uh, where kids don't have anything. And um, sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> Um, and so, so anyway, so you pack this. They do ask that you put a $9 check in the box that just helps to pay for the shipping costs because they do go everywhere. So you can put it in the box or you can actually go online. And, um, and if you go online, then you can print out the label and it has a little uh, code on it and they will email you back where your shoebox went. Um, Kat went yesterday, got a whole bunch of shoe boxes. We have all the information in those shoe boxes, and they'll be out there after um, the service. If there aren't enough, we'll get more, or you can just go and get one. And um, there you go. I don't know what else. <laughs> <laughs> Give him a hand, would you? They'll, they, they'll be in the lobby after service today. If you have any more questions, uh, they'll answer for you, but make sure to pick up a shoebox on your way out. We have 50 of them out there. Some have already been picked up, so make sure to grab one and share the love of God with a child this Christmas season. Amen. Give them a big hand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, today, How many of you have ever found meat that was hard to chew? That's, that one's going to be pretty hard to chew. I want to speak to you for just a little while this morning on this topic. Turn around, look at your neighbor, and say, the pressure cooker. There was a uh, story about a lion. It was, he was establishing himself as the king of the jungle, and he went around and began to demand of all the animals who the king of the jungle was. And so he went to a bear and he walked up to the bear and he roared and he said, who's the king of the jungle? And the bear said, why, why you are, of course. And he <clears throat> licked his lips satisfied and walked on. He came up to the tiger and when he got to the tiger, he roared again who's the king of the jungle? And the tiger looked at him and said, well, you are your majesty. Obviously, everyone knows you are. And he smiled and grinned, and he said, that's right, I am. And he walked off, and he came up to an elephant, and he looked at the elephant, and he said, who's the king of the jungle? And that elephant grabbed that lion up, slung it over against a tree. He grabbed the lion again, just started beating it into the ground, threw it into the water, grabbed it out of the water, slung it up on ground, and the lion got up bruised 
and looked at the elephant and said, just because you don't know the answer is no reason to get upset. <laughs> How many of you have ever had some questions in life that you didn't have the answer to? And sometimes it's in those frustrating moments that make or break us and we have to determine what we're going to do when we don't know the answer. Turn around and look at your neighbor. And well, I know everybody tells me this makes me uncomfortable. I'm thinking, man, I, if, when, you can talk to me about being uncomfortable when you've stood in the middle of Russia, got packed into a bus like a sardine where if somebody wanted to pick your pocket, you'd have just had to look at him and say, help yourself. And I, I, I want us to get a little close and personal today. So go, go ahead and look at your neighbor. Introduce yourself if you don't know each other. Just take a moment and introduce yourself. Hi, my name's Rick McNeely. I've told everybody you're real friendly people. <laughs> and, and say this with me. Sometimes I don't have all the answers. And there's no, there's no crime and there's no shame in not having all the answers. But what you need to understand is that while I may not have all the answers, I know someone that does have all the answers, and his name is Jesus. So if you would go with me into the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting with verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting with verse 8. Paul is speaking. He says, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word that it's life. We just ask you to have your way today, and we give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's all right. I'm going to come out here to where you all live at. The, uh, how many of you have ever had problems before? Anybody ever have problems? How many of you have ever had problems that caused stress? Have you ever felt pressure from your problems before? You know, I, I thought about how problems change. You know, when you're, when you're a child or when, when you're a kid in... Oh, I forgot. <laughs> I was thinking. I wanted you to make sure you're going to hear me today. Okay. <laughs> When, when you were a kid in high school, boy, that feels a lot better. I don't have anything in my hands now. When you were a kid in high school or in grade school, what was the letter you feared the most in the alphabet? F. F. That's almost spoken like someone. Okay, no. It was F. Everybody say F. F. Nobody wanted to see an F show up on a report card or on a test and then have to take that home to your parents and explain it. And, and those F's would just cause a tremendous amount of pressure. And I found out that a lot hasn't changed since I got out of high school. I'm still de dealing with F's that give me problems. What are you talking about? There are four F's that can cause a tremendous amount of pressure. Family, friends, finance, and fitness. Say it with me again. Family, friends, finance, and fitness. Isn't it odd that if you've ever had a squabble in your family, how that mama can't get any rest and, and it's just like not everything, you feel like you're walking with your foot out of joint and, and until that's resolved and you can bring peace to that situation. But there's sometimes that you're, you're, you're not capable of doing it and, and it gets frustrating and you feel that pressure building up. But you have to understand something. We are not the Prince of Peace. Amen. But my daddy is. <laughs> my daddy is. Amen. When we have friends, how many of you have ever had a fair weather friend? You know what I'm talking about there? Oh, I, you're the best. You're wonderful. And you find out they've been talking about you all week long. <laughs> you ever have friends that can only have one friend at a time? You're my best friend this week. But next week, I'm going to find another, and we're going to talk about you. Friends, friends that you think are there, and then you find out they're not there. It can be very disheartening, create pressure, finances. How many of you have ever had bills after you'd run out of money? 
You still had bills due. I remember a lady went into a, a, a courthouse for writing bad checks. This is a true story. She went into a courthouse for writing bad checks, and the judge fined her and said, Elsie, I've told you about this over and over. You're fine to, I think he fined her $100, and she looked up at the judge and said, I left my checkbook at home. <laughs> Can't pay that fine. Sometimes it's hard to figure out how could I be out of money when I still got a box full of checks. <laughs> And so those things can cause pressure. They, they, they cause trouble for us. I, I thought about fitness. Sometimes you, how many of you found out as you got older, you don't jump quite as high as you used to? You know, and, and it's, and, 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 you know, and, and so you, you deal with health and fitness and staying fit. We, I don't understand why it's not working out for me. I've watched every video on cardio that you can watch. Oh, I guess you're supposed to do more than watch it. <laughs> See, sometimes problems are just forced on us. Problems that we didn't ask for, that we weren't expecting. Other times, we invite problems into our lives, right? I mean, if you don't want family problems, then talk sweet to your wife. What'd you say? <laughs> she said, I got an amen in the front corner here. Uh-huh. If, if you, you know, even think about this. The Scripture tells us, it says, for the children to honor your mother and father. But then what's it go on to say? It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, to anger. What's he saying? Don't do things that intentionally stir up stuff. How many of you have ever been guilty of saying something you knew you shouldn't have said, but you said it anyway because you were in the heat of the moment and it felt good to get it out? You know what I mean? And then it's like you want to recall it. Everybody say pressure. You know, you're not going to get through life without pressure. The question is, what will you do with the pressure that you're facing? I, I thought about the apostle Paul when sometimes we listen to his story and he talks about pressure. If you have your Bibles, go with me to 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. I want to read a passage for you, but I want you to understand what's happening in this passage. Paul is, after Paul had established this church at Corinth and come through, other preachers came in behind him and they were trying to undermine the work he was doing. They were throwing off on Paul and saying he's not all that and telling him that, you know, that he, you know, trying to put him down. And, and so, and, and these people were buying into it, and, and Paul's feeling this pressure, and, and, and he's finally just had it. He, he just, you know, and so he starts talking to them, and as he talks to them, he tells them about, he said, listen, he said, I'm going to speak to you as a moment as a fool, but you seem to like fools to speak to you. You, you seem to endure them, so let me lay out something for you. These people that seem to be super apostles, he said, I, I, it doesn't matter to me what they say they are. Let me give you some facts. Let me share with you what this gospel has cost me. And this is what he starts. This is in 2 Corinthians 11, chapter 11, verses 24 to 27. He says, five different times, everybody say five times. Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I face danger from rivers and from robbers. I face danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I face danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I've worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. He starts talking to them about this. He's saying, look, 
He said, it's one thing for you to talk about living for God and who you are and the great relationship you got with God, but it's another thing to walk it out and to go through those nights of pressure and sleepless nights and when the world comes crashing in on you, uh, to go to God and say, I know that you're still able. I know that you're the one. And so the first scripture I read to you in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9, let's revisit that again. Now knowing how, what Paul has gone through, what he's been, how many of you have ever had some tough times? Now let me ask a question because this discerns some things. See, you, you're not going to get through life without tough times, whether you're saint or sinner. But the question is, have you gone through tough times because you chose Christ? Have you all of a sudden had a bullseye put on your back because you said yes to Jesus? That's what Paul's talking about. Everything he talked about suffering, he was suffering because of a choice that he made to serve Christ. And yet when you look at for the Second Corinthians again, and you see what he writes there, the fourth chapter, eighth, ninth verse, he says, troubled, not distressed, perplexed, not, forsa- not in despair, persecuted, not forsaken, cast down, not destroyed. That almost feels like a calm wind in the middle of a fierce storm. How can he write those words? How can Paul having gone through everything he went through, be able to step up and say, I'm persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed. It's because Paul knew something about the pressure cooker. Everybody say it with me, the pressure cooker. For a moment, I want us to focus on this pressure cooker. There are two two here, one that was made in the early 1900s. Am I right? 30s, in the 1930s. One that's a little bit more modern. Both operated on the same principle. So let's have a lesson in cooking. Water boils at what temperature? 212 degrees. Water boils at 212 degrees. Do you know it never gets any hotter than that? It's all, it's 200, once it starts boiling, it doesn't get more than 212 degrees. It's 212 degrees. If it turns to steam coming out, of it, it's still, the, the steam's 212 degrees. But what happens when you put something in a, so if I'm, if I'm putting something in a pot and I'm cooking it, the most it's going to cook at is 212 degrees unless I put it in a concealed environment and apply pressure. Everybody say the pressure cooker. When I put it in, and I, I want you to hang on here because remember, anything that happens in the natural world has a spiritual correlation. So when you put something in a concealed environment and it's set down inside of a pressure cooker, then the steam doesn't escape and it begins to get hotter. So instead of cooking at 212 degrees now the temperature's gotten up to 257 degrees and it will cook quicker it will take less energy and it will not destroy what's in the pot let me say it again it will cook quicker it will take less energy and it will not destroy what's in the pot do you know that it takes two-thirds less time, almost two-thirds less time to cook inside of a pressure cooker than it does on top of the stove. So not only are you saving time, you're saving money because it takes less gas and electricity. You say, Pastor, what in the world's that got to do with us? Well, how many of you know that God has a pressure cooker all of his own? <laughs> So when you're in a trial, let's just kind of look at this. When, when you're going through a test, do you want it to be prolonged or do you want it to be over quickly? 
Everybody in high school, do you want the ACE tests to last longer or do you want it to end sooner? If you're getting ready to go into the doctor's office or you got to go to the hospital and they're going to run tests on you, do you want them to run a, a, a long, long, long series of tests or do you want them to get it done? Everybody look at your neighbor and say, get her done. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't want to prolong this thing because here's what happens. When you prolong testing, it works on you. It makes you worry. It makes you fear. And it can cause doubt when it's prolonged. I, how many of you have ever had to go in and get a shot before? How many of you can remember your first shot? Nobody can remember there was a bad memory. Danny can remember. I remember telling, I remember telling my siblings, nothing to worry. I was the youngest. Nothing to worry about these shots. I'd been in and I'd gotten some uh, shots before. I said, you got nothing to worry about. It's okay. My, my oldest brother's six years older than I am. And it was, you know, it, it went down the line until it got to me. So I'm letting them all know, you got nothing to worry about. Just watch me. I didn't know they were going to give me the shot last. And so they started with my older brother. And I don't know if they conspired against me, but when he got that shot, he contorted his face in such a way that you would have thought that they had just sucked his insides out. <laughs> he was, ah! <laughs> My next brother followed suit. My sisters did the same thing. When they got to me, I looked at that nurse. I said, you ain't touching me. I'm telling you this true story. It took two of them. One of them, I'm just a little guy. One of them came in and held me down while the other one gave me the shot. Why? Because the process got prolonged. If it had started with me, Amen. I wouldn't have gone through all that. But because I'm watching everybody else, there's a lesson in that. Get your eyes off of everybody else and get your eyes on Jesus because he's the one that can keep you in that time of need. Everybody say the cooker. <laughs> so think about this. It takes two-thirds less time, less energy, less emotional stress. Hebrews 4 and 12. For the word of God is quick. Everybody say quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. What's he saying? He's saying, look, when you turn to me, I got you covered. I'm, I'm able to take care of this. I'm going to put you into a pressurized system. Paul knew something about pressure cookers. Paul was a religious zealot. Everybody say religious. And here's what you got to understand. Back in those days, religion didn't go along with Christianity. As a matter of fact, Paul was attacking Christians. He thought they were heretics. He had people committed to prison and put to death. And he's, he's rocking along, doing his own thing. Everybody say floating his own boat. How many of you have ever tried to float your own boat? You know what happens when you lose your oars? You're stuck. And so what God does is God puts Paul in a situation that's getting ready to pressure cook him. He finds himself on a road to Damascus, and this man that was so confident, so, so hard-hearted, all of a sudden finds himself on the receiving end of the mercy of God, but he doesn't know it's mercy yet. Amen. Anybody ever been there? Amen. All of a sudden, you find yourself in a situation and you think, oh, no, this is going and, and you don't know that it's God showing his mercy. You just haven't discovered it's mercy yet. You think this is horrible. This is going to end. He not only is he knocked down, he loses his ability to see. Anybody in here ever saw something? that they thought was one way only to discover it wasn't what you thought you saw at all. Amen. Let me give you a classic example. You walk into a room full of people and you look across and somebody catches your eye and they, they, they look over at you, they smile, they turn to the other person and they say something, they start laughing. 
Well, immediately, you think they're laughing at you. And so you've, you've, you've oh, well, laughing at me, huh? I'm, and, and you don't realize that when you walked in, you interrupted that story, and he saw you and, and thought, oh, there's my friend, and smiled at you and waved at you and caught your attention, and then he turned around and finished his story, and they started laughing about the story. So now you're upset with someone that really likes you, really cares about you, and thought enough to stop his conversation to acknowledge your entrance into the room. Oh, that hurts. <laughs> See, we can get it so messed up so easy, and that's where Paul's at. It's not that Paul doesn't love God. It's just that he's got everything messed up. And sometimes the only way you can take care of that is to, for God to get you in a concealed environment. Do you ever feel like you were all alone even when you were in a room full of people? Because God wants to talk to you. He wants to speak to your heart. He wants to speak to your situation. When Paul comes out of that pressure cooker, he's not hard-hearted anymore. He's, I mean, it's amazing. He, he's changed. He's transformed. Do you know that you can take and put, this is, does that look fresh? Does that look frozen? It's frozen. <laughs> now, here's the problem. It's like if I'm going to, I tell Debbie, I say, here, I, I want this for supper. She's going to say, well, you should have let it thaw out. I can't tell you how many conversations we've had. What do you want for supper? I said, oh, I don't care. I said, well, you want some chicken? She said, yeah, well, I, I don't have any out to thaw. We have to thaw it out. And, and so we think, well, that process takes too long. Now we've got to wait for the stuff to thaw out. Not if you have the pressure cooker. With a pressure cooker, it can handle your hard-heartedness. <laughs> the pressure cooker can handle your hard-headedness. The pressure cooker is able to, Debbie said ours. I, okay, I got my head and heart in there too. <laughs> so it's able to handle all those we think we know it when we really don't know it, but he's got to show us that we don't know it so he has to conceal us and confine us because he doesn't want to embarrass us. So he puts us in the cooker. Now, here's the neat thing. <laughs> I can put these in the cooker along with that. I can put these in the cooker. Everybody say a carrot. The most, well, not the most, but I, I can take and put in delicate, crisp vegetables with a chunk of hard-hearted meat, put them in the same environment, conceal them, pressurize them, and they both come out done smelling great. Amen. What's taking care of this hard-hearted meat is not destroying the vegetable. Let me create a scenario for you. There is a woman that is caught in the act of adultery. They grab her and they throw her at the feet of Jesus. And they say, the law says stone her. What do you say? This woman's fragile. This woman, can you imagine the pressure she's under? Can you imagine what she's feeling? This is a reality, folks. According to the law, she's going to die in just a matter of moments when those rocks start pelting her and so here's the situation you've got someone tender and broken at his feet and someone hard-hearted in his face and he says the law says stoner what do you say and he takes time to go down and draw in the sand what did he write in the sand? Get me my pressure cooker. <laughs> no, he didn't really write that. But. And he comes up, and he does something unique that people don't even realize happened standing there watching. He puts that lady and those Pharisees in the same cooker, conceals it, She's at his feet being protected. 
They're in his face getting ready to be confronted in the same environment. And when he gets done, they drop the rocks. He looks at them and he puts the pressure on. He that's without sin. Matter of fact, one translation, if you, if you look at that, it, it, it can be translated he that's without sin or he that hasn't done the same sin. You know what always amazed me about that story? Is the guy is nowhere to be found. The law didn't say just stone the woman. The law said they were both supposed to be stoned. Where's the guy at? Maybe the guy was one of their friends. Maybe it's, it's his night out on the town. <laughs> and they take turns and swap out. I don't know what's going on. I do know that they never mentioned the guy, and the guy had to be there because they said she was caught in the very act. When all of a sudden we start meeting out punishment according to our thinking, instead of showing God's mercy, friend, you can rest assured there's a pressure cooker going to show up in your life, and you ought to thank God when it comes in. Amen. And so in that environment, he looks at them, and he said, he that's without sin casts the first stone. And man, the pressure's on. These guys begin to think, and do you know that the God that created your mind is able to fill your mind? And don't you know at that moment that everything that they had ever done started flashing up in their mind and these guys are beginning to panic in their heart and they're thinking, he knows all about me. They start dropping rocks and walking away and this poor young girl that's down at his feet that expected to die to feel the pain of rocks pounding her instead felt the hand of grace grip her, raise her up, look her in the eye and heard the words of mercy see neither do I condemn thee go and sin no more and my friend when he walked away from that situation both of them had been cooked <laughs> aren't you glad for a God that's able to give us what we have need of even when we don't realize we need it Amen. stay with me here a second because here's what happened in that situation. Jesus caused the Pharisees to find compassion by looking at their own sin. And he caused the young girl to recognize that what I am doing is wrong. Amen. So I'm not going to do it anymore. He gave her the opportunity to get up and try again. <laughs> How about it, folks? Anybody in here like to get up and try again? <laughs> I may have been knocked down a few times, but I ain't out. Rocky Marciano had the reputation of never having been knocked out. He had knocked several people out, but he'd never been knocked out. And in one of his final fights, the stories told that he went into the ring and the guy knocked him down. And they couldn't believe it. And the guy kept, you know, he, he just kept pounding him. But Rocky would not stay down. The announcer was talking about somebody ought to stop this fight. But he kept going back into the ring. It's where the series Rocky originated from. It was the idea of Rocky Marciano. And so he goes back, and when he gets back up, the guy knocked him down again. He walks to the corner. Rocky gets back up. While he gets back up, the guy looks. He's shaking his head. Man, I can't believe it. He walks out to fight him again. Rocky came up with a hook, man, knocked the guy out, and, they, and he won the fight. They interviewed him afterwards. They're asking him about the fight, and he said, I knew as long as I kept getting up, I, I was going to get a chance. Uh, hear me. Uh, the the devil may knock you down. Don't let him keep you down. You can get up. There's a pressure cooker that's got your name on it. Amen. God will take every situation that you face, whether it's finances, family, friends, fitness, whatever it is, put it inside that pressure cooker. Amen. And say, when I get, when it's done in here, it's going to be okay. Everybody say it with me. It's going to be okay. Now, here's the thing. How many of you had mama cook with a pressure cooker? Or you remember a pressure cooker either at your mom's house or your grandma's house, but you were around a pressure cooker? Pressure cookers do what? They, they shoot steam. They build up, right? 
they build up. So, so what did mama or grandma always tell you? No, 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 no. What did they tell you? Don't touch the pressure cooker. Don't get around that pressure cooker. Don't touch it. That thing blow up, blow your head clean off your shoulders. I'm telling you, man, my mom made a believer out of me. <laughs> so I, but I, I, there was something about the pressure cooker that would draw me to it. I think because in, in the house when the pressure cooker was going, you heard this. You know what I'm talking about? That, that thing was. And I'd be in there and, I, and that little. That, the little I, see, none of, nobody had a jiggler. I got, you got a jiggler? I didn't know you had one. I, I've got, I've got, each one works kind of the same way. Watch this. There is a, everybody say regulator. So you're able to look at that and know what's happening in the pot. But when it's God's pressure cooker, guess who the regulator is? God. So you don't get to look to see what's happening in the pot. You just experience it. There's a safety valve on this thing that will not allow the pressure to exceed what it ought to. He said he would put no more on you than you can bear. He won't let it get overwhelming. With every temptation, he does what? He makes a way to escape. He, that woman laying at his feet. The wages of sin is death, and that's what she was facing, but he made a way for her to escape. I'm telling you, if it weren't for God by my side, the Scripture said, let Israel now say, if it weren't for the Lord by my side, where would we be? What would be the sum total of our life? We have to understand that God knows where we're at. He knows what we're going through, and he wants us to enjoy our journey. Amen. So instead of trying to mess with it, let, it do, let the pressure cooker do its thing. How many of you have ever had someone that needed God, got in a bad situation, and you wanted to run to the rescue? I've had parents come to me, to, you know, praying for their children, and, and then all of a sudden their children get in a mess, and then they run and bail them out. And I, I, I remember I was in Indiana one time, and I looked at the lady, and I said, I know you love your son, but if you keep bailing him out, you're not giving God an opportunity to work on him. Amen. And, man, her mouth just dropped open. I said, you're asking God to save your son. Then you need to leave your son in God's hands and quit trying to pop the lid off this pressure cooker. Let it build up enough pressure on him that that hard-hearted heart he's got going on can be penetrated. And when it comes out, it comes out new. Amen. Now, I love me some good steak. But I don't want it raw. There are people in Arkansas that, no reflection on anybody from Arkansas, but there are people in Arkansas, I knew some folks in Arkansas, and every year they used to, for New Year's, so how many of you around here at New Year's have the uh, tradition of eating like black-eyed peas or hog jowl or something like that? You know, you've got some type of tradition. Wave your hand if you've got a tradition. Ham and beans? How many of you eat hog jowl? At New Year's. Hold, hold your hand up. I want to come to your house on New Year's. Okay. I, it's, so there's this tradition. They had a tradition. They, they were, yeah, they were in Wisconsin, but they originally came from Arkansas. Or they were in Arkansas when they were doing it. It's called a raw beef sandwich. So they take hamburger meat and they chip, it up, chip onions up in it, mix it up. And they don't cook it. They put that on a bun. <laughs> oh, it's a wonderful tradition. I'm looking at the lady, and I'm trying to be kind. I thought, lady, if you think I want a tapeworm, you got <laughs> That's what they're eating, man. They're eating. Oh, this is so good. You're not going to convince me that that's good. I don't care how big you're smiling. <laughs> that's not good. I can tell you for sure it's not good for you. But we're so used to doing it our way. Amen. 
I was in Mexico and I went to this, this couple's house and they, they owned a store. And I, I, you know, I've always, when I did mission work, I always tried to eat what was set before me. But man, they cooked, they didn't cook. They warmed up some raw hamburger meat. And now I don't know what was going on because it all wasn't like that, okay? It was, I don't, I don't know if they changed cooks in the middle of the shift or what happened, but they, they brought out these hamburgers and the guy that was with me bit into his and I promise you, man, blood ran out of that thing. It was completely raw in the center and he's looking there going, God is my witness. I start praying, God, please, please, I don't mind a little pink. But God, please do not let blood run out of my sandwich when I bite into it. God, please show mercy on me. I bit into it. My sandwich was good. Thank you, Jesus. The missionary's wife bit into hers. And she saw it and she said, could you take this back and cook it, please? See, it was okay for her to do it because she was from there. But I wasn't. This is what I'm telling you. We do things and consume things that we normally wouldn't simply because we want control. Everybody say control. So when they're eating this raw beef and they're calling it a tradition, it, it's got nothing linked to whether or not it's good for you. It's just that I get to control it. Everybody say control. Do you know what happens if my wife is trying to control my driving? No, I don't get upset. I just pull over. Here, baby. <laughs> just anybody ever had that? Oh, we're the only ones that have ever had that happen. Anybody ever have that happen? Wave your hand. You're all going to have to repent after this service is over, all this lying going on in here. Okay. So it's just because, you know, she said, honey, th this, this happened to me. We're on our way to church. And it's while I was evangelizing, we're on our way to a church. And she said, honey, you can speed up. You can speed up. I said, baby, I'm doing the limit. They give you five over. Speed up. Speed up. I sped up. I got a ticket. I can take you to the place where he pulled me over. <laughs> I looked at her. I got back in the car. And I'm thinking, well, I was in the car. And I'm thinking, <laughs> When he finally gave me the ticket, I turned around, I looked at her, and I said, well, I hope you're satisfied now. I, you know, you told me to speed up, got a ticket. And she said, well, think of all those times you sped up and you didn't get one. <laughs> Pressure cooker. Everybody say, give it to God. We've got to quit trying to control the situation. Put God in the driver's seat and let God drive. Let him be the pilot. I saw a plate that said, God's my co-pilot. I'm not getting on your plane, baby. I want God to be my pilot. I don't want him sitting halfway over there trying to nudge me into doing what's right. I want him to control the wheel. Everybody say, control it. So you say, I don't get, how does, this, how does this pressure cooker thing work like that? How, how, how can it work? I mean, you're, you're talking about cooking. That doesn't happen in the real world. Anybody ever fly on a jet plane? Six to seven miles straight up in the air. Doing 600 miles an hour. Sipping coffee and flipping a magazine. What? <laughs> if you told me that you were seven miles up doing 600 miles an hour, I would expect you to be hanging on for dear life and your hair to blow clean off your head. <laughs> how, can you, how can you sit in an environment like that and relax because you're in a pressurized cabin do you hear what I'm going to tell you? When the devil is trying to take you out, when he's creating pressure around you, when he's trying to make the journey more than you can bear, my friend, God is able to scoop you up and put you in a compartment doing 600 miles an hour straight up and sipping coffee as you go. Why? Because my God is more than enough. No wonder 
Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Everybody say, I can. It's time some of us get in the canon business. I can. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I can walk this road. I can overcome this obstacle. I can find peace in the midst of turmoil as long as God is with me. Because God before me, who my friend can be against me? Let me end with this story today. There was a man that he, he got with a shepherd. And when he was with the shepherd, he, he, he wanted to spend the night with the shepherd. He was riding and, and he, he wanted to see the life of a shepherd. And when it got dark, he got nervous because he heard coyotes begin to howl. And while all these coyotes were howling, he said the shepherd just very matter-of-factly didn't panic, didn't get upset. He just went and started a fire. And he began to build this fire up until its flames reached way in the air. And he stood at the fire. The reporter said, I noticed like diamonds in the night and he said, I finally realized that what I was seeing were the sheep's eyes. Instead of the sheep looking into the dark where the danger was, they all had their eyes on the shepherd that was producing light. Shouldn't we do the same? Would you stand with me? Your life doesn't have to be filled with turmoil and chaos. You can choose to give it to God. My mom, it's gone now, but I, I remember that pressure cooker and she'd pop that baby open. And I never, I've, I've never been a big roast, you know, and potato guy. Debbie loves it. I like it too, but when it came out of this pot, I'm telling you, you take a fork and it just flake off. Those carrots, the, I, a piece of meat that was frozen went in there and came out flaking off. Carrots that went in there like this, you'd think would just be mushed to nothing, but they still had firmness. They were, they were delicious. And those potatoes, you put a little bit of gravy on that. I know I'm the only thing between you and the dinner table right now. But I'm telling you, some things are worth waiting for. Amen. Don't try and rush God. We get microwave dinners, pop them in and have them back in 60 seconds, and are upset because they taste kind of funny. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. <laughs> Listen to what he said we're going to do. You're going to mount up with wings like an eagle. You're going to walk and not be weary and you'll run and you won't faint. Why? Because he's got you right where he wants you. I'm going to ask prayer partners to come up if they would just come up and stand with me. And while they're on their way up, I, if you would, folks, I'd, I'd like you to take a moment and pray with me for those that are watching today live on stream. Would you do that? Would you just stretch your faith toward heaven for them right now? You that are listening on the radio or watching live, I don't know where you, what your situation is or what your circumstance is, but God does. And he wants nothing more than to right now rescue you. It's something you need to understand. The pressure cooker isn't just created to break our hard heart and save our lives from sin, but the pressure cooker is created to help us know our purpose. Joseph went into the pressure cooker, sold 
lied on and forgotten. But in all that situation that was happening to him, where it seemed like he had been forsaken, <laughs> he wasn't forsaken at all. Cast down, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. And Joseph came out of that experience equipped to do what God called him to. My friend, that's what God's doing for you right now. He's trying to equip you for what he's called you to. Church, would you pray with me right now? If you're watching, I want you to pray this prayer with me now. Lord Jesus, I ask you into my heart, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I believe that you died on a cross and that God rose you up, that he, you came up on the third day. You were resurrected, and I receive you right now as my personal Savior, and I praise you for what you're doing for me in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give him a hand clap of praise in this house today. For those of you that are here, you say, Pastor, I got some stuff going on, and man, it's, I, I mean, I feel pressure building. I want you to take your situation and commit it to the hand of God today. I'm going to invite Bobby and his mama to come up. The family can come up. They, they drove all the way from East Prairie to be here today. They diagnosed her with stage four lung cancer. And she came for prayer this morning. I want to tell you, Bobby, what happened in the office right before you guys get in here. I was making it in my notes because you can ask people around here. I'm real bad about forgetting things. So I was, I was, I was putting in my notes, pray for Bobby's mom. And I, I was typing in lung cancer I, I, in my iPad. I was typing it in. And when I looked up, and I don't know how this happened, but when I looked up, instead of having typed lung cancer, I looked and what I had typed was lying cancer. <laughs> and I, 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 I thought, oh, I messed up. And, and then it was like I felt like God said, no, no, no. No, you, you hadn't messed up. How many of you know that cancer is a lie from the pit of hell? God did not create cancer. Cancer is a result of the fall. Now, we understand you love God, you're a winner, however it goes. We, get, we got that, right? We know that, that. That Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, but you'd like to hang around for a little while, right? So here's what we're doing today. We're believing God to get rid of that lying cancer. Amen? Amen? You say, oh, now you're stepping out on a limb, Pastor. No, I'm not. I don't have to heal her. God's the healer. Now, we've got a lady in here. I don't know if she's here today, if Melissa's here. She was scheduled for surgery. She had vertebrae in her neck that were messed up, and they were going to have to go in for surgery. She came up for prayer. We had prayer for her. She went back, and the doctors went to check her before they went in to do the surgery to check everything out and make sure it, nothing had moved or anything. And when they checked her out, it was already done. It was healed, man. It was God had taken care of it. Dodie Osteen was sent home to die. They said, there's nothing we can do for you. She wrote out every healing scripture she could find. That's been, I think, over 30 years ago, and she's still alive. They'd given her three months. I'm telling you that God's got you in his pressure cooker. Are you ready for it? Go on, stretch your hands to heaven with me right now. You've given hold it, hold it, hold it. There's something I want you to do for me, and that's to stretch your hands in faith. Because God honors faith. God's glad we've got compassion, but that's not what, that's not what gets prayers answered. Everybody say faith. faith. Just a little bit of faith. We used to sing a song, you don't need a whole lot, just use what you got. Faith, 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 just a little bit of faith. Do you believe that he's able? Stretch your hands to heaven. Church, do you believe that he's able? If you do, stretch your hands to heaven with me. Come on, raise your hands. 
hands in love with me right now. something and it's too much pressure for you what I'm encouraging you to do today is put it in God's hand and ask him to put it in his pressure cooker because when it goes in his pressure cooker he's going to take you into a concealed environment where he's able to take care of what your need is there stretch your hands to heaven with me right now and say it with me God I give it up to you right now Everything that I'm facing, I'm putting into your hand. Look at me just a second. I know you've been concerned about your mama, but your mama was concerned about you. And God's answered that prayer. So as you stretch your hands to heaven today, you walk in the knowledge that God answered mama's prayer that you're not where you were a few months ago, that everything's changed. And that's the same faith that you're walking in, a faith where everything's changed. The Bible said old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That means even the way I look at things are new, that I don't, I'm not in desperation. I'm standing in faith knowing that my God is more than enough. He's not, if, if the only time that I'm linking into God is when everything's smooth, then I really don't know whether or not I'm linked into God at all because anybody can walk a smooth road. But when the road gets rocky and there are obstacles that I've got to climb over, that's when I know that God is with me. That's why David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because you're with me. What's David saying? David said, I'm not hanging out here. I'm walking through it. I'm going through it. Stretch your hands to heaven with me right now and say, God, I'm walking through it. Come on and love him with me today. another by the hand we're going to pray a dismissal prayer I want you to get this because you've got somebody's answer you are God's answer to someone's prayer your testimony what what you're going to say to them what you're going to do to affect that life don't walk around feeling like I got nothing and I, I'm not able. My friend, you're more than able through God. Everybody say it with me, I can. Say it again, I can. I can do all things. I can climb the mountain. I can walk the valley. I can swim the ocean. I can step across the river. I can do all things 
through Christ. I can make it through good days and I can make it through bad days. I can rejoice when the sun's shining and I can rejoice when it's raining because if God's for me, nobody can be against me. And I give you praise for that right now in Jesus' name. Come on, raise those hands to heaven. Father, I thank you today for what you've spoken into our hearts. Let us walk in the power and the presence of your spirit and your word. And let us understand that the pressure's never too much for you because you wrap your arms around us. Conceal us into a safe zone where you're able to give us exactly what we have need of and present us to the world we give you praise for that in jesus name amen god bless you today look forward to seeing you next week don't forget israel but choose with us next week